Let's go over what the limit superior and limit inferior of a sequence are. In this video, we'll see the definition, a couple important theorems related to the concepts, and we'll go over a good handful of examples. And I'll leave chapters in the description so you can skip around the video. First, I just want to give you a visual explanation because I think that's going to make the definition a lot easier to understand. Let's say this is the graph of the first handful of terms of some sequence that we could call A, N. And let's assume that it continues more or less in this trend off of the graph. So we've got a pretty good idea of what this sequence looks like. We could consider what the supremum is of all terms of the sequence. And if we just assume that it continues to go around this direction, then the supremum of all terms of the sequence would be this first term here, since that is the maximum term that the sequence would ever take on, meaning it's certainly the supremum. Recall that the supremum is the least upper bound, and the infimum is the greatest lower bound. Links in the description to my lessons introducing those topics if you need a recap. As we said, it appears that the first term of this sequence, a1 is the supremum of all terms in the sequence. The limit superior of the sequence is kind of like the supremum, but considered long term. The supremum of the sequence in the long term for the infinite tail at the end of the sequence. That's the idea of the limit superior. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, instead of considering the supremum of all terms of the sequence, we could cut the sequence off at the start. Say we cut off a finite number of terms. Maybe we just cut off the first term. And so we only consider terms of the sequence after the first term. Then what would the supremum of all terms of the sequence be after the first term? Well, based on this picture, it appears that this term, a3, would be the supremum in this case. What if we cut off an additional term? Maybe we consider all terms of the sequence that are after the second term. In this case, the supremum hasn't changed. It still appears to be the third term of the sequence. But again, maybe we cut off even more terms. Now we could consider the supremum of all terms of the sequence after the third term. In this case, it appears that the eighth term of the sequence is the supremum of this tail of the sequence of all the terms after the third term. Hopefully you can imagine continuing in this way, cutting off more and more of the beginning of the sequence and repeatedly asking what's the supremum of the remaining tail after a certain point. In this way, we could construct a sequence of supremums and it's the limit of that sequence of supremums which is the limit superior of the original sequence A n. Similar things, of course, could be said regarding the limit inferior. Maybe we cut off just the first term of the sequence and ask, what's the infimum of the terms that remain, the terms after the first term? Then maybe we cut off an additional term. What's the infimum of the terms of the sequence after the second term? And so on. In this way, we could construct a sequence of infimums, and it is the limit of that sequence which is the limit inferior of the original sequence AN. Hopefully that gives you enough of a feel for this stuff that the definition now will be meaningful to you. Let's say that SN is a bounded sequence of real numbers. Then here are our definitions. The limit superior of this bounded sequence SN is the limit of the supremums of the tails, where the tails cut off more and more of the beginning of the sequence, right? You see SN, but only where N is greater than this big N, but big N is tending to infinity. So we keep cutting off more of the beginning of the sequence, and at each step asking what's the supremum of the tail, and it's the limit of the supremums of the tails, which is the limit superior of the sequence. We said that the sequence is bounded, but for the limit superior to be defined, it only needs to be bounded above. Similarly, the limit inferior of SN is the limit of the infimums of the tails of the sequence, where those tails cut off more and more of the beginning of the sequence at each step. And it's the limit of those infimums of the tails, which is the limit inferior. For the limit inferior to be defined, the sequence SN need only be bounded below. 
Of course, if it's a straight up bounded sequence that's bounded above and below, then we will have both a limit superior and a limit inferior. Some textbooks will also define the limit superior and inferior for unbounded sequences, so we should cover that real quick. If our sequence Sn is unbounded, then the supremum of any tail may not be finite. It may be the case that no matter how far we go in the sequence, no matter how much we cut off of the beginning, there's still no finite supremum of the remaining terms. In that case, we would say that the supremum is positive infinity, and then that the limit superior is also positive infinity. Similarly, if the function's not bounded below, then the infimum of all of the tails will be called negative infinity, and we would call the limit inferior of the sequence negative infinity. Now I want to quickly mention two theorems regarding limit superiors and limit inferiors, and then we'll go through a bunch of examples. I'll leave links in the description to my lessons proving these theorems. The first theorem here is pretty interesting. It's regarding the connection between a sequence's limit and the limit superior and inferior. If we have a sequence an of real numbers, then the limit of an is equal to l if and only if the limit inferior and limit superior are both also equal to L. The second theorem is this. Let's let an be a bounded sequence of real numbers, and we'll let big A be the set of subsequential limits of an. That means all of the subsequences of an that have limits, this is the set of all those limits. Big A is the set of all the limits of any subsequence of an. So it turns out the limit superior of the sequence an is actually the maximum of its subsequential limits, and the limit inferior is the minimum of the subsequential limits. Pretty interesting results. Again, proofs in the description. Hopefully those theorems give you some idea of how these definitions could end up being useful, but I think we're ready now to get our hands dirty with some examples. So let's go to the first one. Let's let the sequence Sn be this sequence that repeats in a pattern of four, 0, 1, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, and so on. What is the limit superior of this sequence? Well, if we took the supremum of all terms of the sequence, that would certainly be 2, since 2 is the greatest value that the sequence takes on. Now, however much we cut off at the beginning of the sequence, the supremum of the remaining tail will continue to be 2 because two keeps occurring in this sequence. So in fact, the supremum of every tail is two, and thus the limit of those supremums, which is the limit superior of the sequence, is equal to two. All right, now what about the limit inferior? That's similar. If we consider what the infimum of the whole sequence is, well, that would be zero, since that's the lowest value that the sequence takes on. However, no matter how far out in the sequence we go, zero continues to occur. And so the infimum of every single tail is zero, and thus the limit of these infimums, and hence the limit inferior of the sequence, is equal to to zero. Here's our second example. Let's let the sequence Tn be this sequence which approaches three with its odd terms and approaches one from above with its even terms. What is the limit superior of this sequence? No matter how far we go in this sequence, we're going to continue having the odd position terms which get arbitrarily close to 3. 2.999, then the tail of the sequence will continue to approach 3. 2.9999, 2.99999, etc. So the supremum of the tail is always going to be 3, because the tail is always going to include these terms that are approaching 3 from below. So 3 is the supremum of each tail, thus making it the limit superior of the sequence Tn. By similar logic, 1 is the limit inferior of the sequence. No matter how far we go in the sequence, we will have these even position terms which are approaching 1 from above, and the tail of the sequence will continue to have terms that get arbitrarily close to 1 from above, meaning that 1 is the greatest lower bound, hence the infimum, 
for every single tail, and thus that makes it the limit inferior of the sequence. In each of these examples, the supremums of each of the tails would always be the same no matter how far we go, and same thing with the infimums, although that won't be the case in the next example. Let's consider the sequence a n, whose nth term is 1 plus negative 1 to the n, all divided by n. To investigate the limit superior and limit inferior of this sequence, it will be helpful to consider the odd position terms and the even position terms because of this negative 1 to the n. For any of the odd position terms, the a 2k plus 1s, negative 1 to an odd power is negative 1, and so the numerator for those terms will be 0. Thus, all of the odd position terms of this sequence are 0. For the even position terms, the a2ks, negative 1 to an even power is positive 1, making the numerator 2, and so we would have 2 divided by that even position, 2k. And of course, that means that each of these terms would just be equal to 1 over k. The fourth term of the sequence, for example, would be where k equals 2. That's the second even term, and that term would be equal to 1 over 2. Clearly, all of these even position terms will be positive, but all of the odd terms are 0, and so at a glance, we can tell that the infimum of any tail of the sequence is going to be 0, and thus the limit inferior of the sequence is also 0. However, the supremum of the tails of the sequence changes depending on how far out we go. If we cut off the first two terms and insist that we look at the tail after the first two terms, the supremum of all of those will be one half, since that's the biggest term in the sequence after the second term. Again, as we said before, one half is the fourth term of this sequence. Or if we cut it off after, say, the fourth term, the supremum of that tail is going to be one-third, because one-third is the biggest value the sequence takes on after its fourth term. It's the sixth term of the sequence, which takes on a value of one-third. And this pattern continues. The supremums of the tails are these fractions, these reciprocals. One-half, one-third, one-fourth, one-fifth. It's going to continue like that. The supremums clearly approach zero. The limit of these supremums of tails is zero. That is, by definition, the limit superior. So the limit superior of a n is zero. And this should make sense. Remember the theorem we mentioned a few minutes ago? The limit of a sequence will be L if and only if its limit superior and limit inferior are both L. And the limit of this sequence is indeed zero, just like its limit inferior and limit superior. One more example, let's let bn be the sequence n times sine of pi n over 2. All of the even n's are going to be multiples of pi, and sine of a multiple of pi is 0. So n times sine in those situations would be 0. So all the even terms of this sequence are 0. When n equals 1, this is sine of pi over 2, which is 1. And 1 times 1 is 1. When n equals 3, this is sine of 3 pi over 2, which is negative 1, but times 3 is negative 3. And going around the circle, continuing to increase n, we're going to alternate sine and get all of these odd numbers. 1, negative 3, 5, negative 7, 9, negative 11, and so on. With that in mind, what's the limit superior of the sequence? Well, no matter how far we go and cut off from the beginning of the sequence, the tail is going to have very, very big, in fact, arbitrarily big, positive numbers. If we go out far enough, we're just going to get bigger and bigger odd numbers. So the limit superior is, in fact, positive infinity. The same thing is true about the limit inferior. As we go further and further in this sequence, we're going to get bigger and bigger negative numbers as well. And so the limit inferior is negative infinity. So since sine of multiples of pi over 2, aside from the zeros, alternates between 1 and negative 1, 
but then we're multiplying it by n. This is going to be a completely unbounded sequence going between big positive numbers and big negative numbers as we go further in the sequence. So this is just an example of infinite limit superiors and inferiors. I hope that was helpful. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and if you find these analysis videos helpful, please consider supporting Wrath of Math on Patreon. Link in the description. Thank you very much for watching. To pick me up and slowly get to know me We'll unwrap each other until we're never lonely Hello. Okay.